Okay, good morning. So, um, I, guess, uh, I guess you've all had a chance to express yourselves on the essay on what you make of all this. So, um, today is our last day on the causal theory of reference. And I'm just going to, um, in the first two sections today, wrap up on uh, some relatively technical things about causal chains and informative identities. And then I want to uh, look a bit at the broad, broader implications of this. There's something about the, a causal theory of representation that really changes, that really affects your picture of the relation of the mind to, to your knowledge of, of your surroundings. I want to try and uh, uh, catch some of that in the last section today. Um, I've been uh, trying to restructure the class quite a bit. And um, after moving all the pieces around quite a lot, I realized that, that um, there are actually quite good reasons for keeping it the way it is. So um, <laughs> not, <laughs> not, <laughs> not for the first time. <laughs> Um, uh, okay, uh, so on Friday we'll go on to um, Putnam's article, Brains in a Vat. Okay, um, okay, oh boy, okay, Brains in a Vat on Friday. Um, okay, so uh, the, where we got to last time, we were talking about the function of language and why you'd want a language at all and Maybe the basic function of a language is to let you transmit knowledge from speaker to hearer. Then uh, if you're thinking of reference in that context, reference uh, in the context of having a system that you can use to transmit knowledge about um, the things in your surroundings, then what reference to the object is going to require is that you should, if you're going to refer to the object, that's the same thing as being in a position to transmit knowledge about that object. And if you think that knowledge is a causal notion, that in general knowledge of the object requires that you be causally connected to it, then that's just going to imply that reference to the object demands that you be causally hooked up to it. There will be a causal connection between the thing and you. So putting that round the other way, Reference to the object is going to require a causal connection to the object in virtue of which you're in a position to transmit knowledge of the object. And obviously not any kind of causal connection is going to do for knowledge. I mean, if you just um, <laughs> hit me with a baseball bat, then um, you will make a big impact on me causally, but I won't um, thereby be in a position to refer to you, if, if you see what I mean. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> I'll be unconscious. <laughs> so not any kind of causal connection is going to be good for um, reference. So this suggests that the kind of causal connection that's going to matter for reference is one in virtue of which you're in a position to transmit knowledge of the object. Evans's uh, formulation was the, the item you're trying to refer to is the item that's a dominant source of your associated body of information. So the idea there was there might be two objects, um, one of which is your dominant source, the other of which is getting some, inf some information into your, the pool of information you associate with a term, um, but that's not the dominant source. That was, that's the model of what that Napoleon example, is whoever's the dominant source of the information you associate with a term, that's the one you're referring to. Um, or I, gave, uh, I tried to give a photograph of... Um, Two different people where you're mostly getting information about one of them, but some information from the other is getting in there. You'd say that's really a photo of the person who's the dominant source of the information in the photo. So in the case of perception, um, the dominant source of your current perceptual information, that will be the object that you're seeing. Um, so you can refer uh, in perception using terms like this table or that table. But if you think a little bit further about uh, the way it goes in perception, if you take a term like this table or that, ta or, uh, that person, then um, when you or I are looking at the table, there's a whole bunch of things that are actually causally involved in perception of it. And for example, there's the sun 
right? Our friend Mr. Sun is involved in uh, here because um, it is light rays from the sun that are bouncing off the table and striking your retina. Um, the window is involved because if it wasn't for the window, then there couldn't be that causal process of the light getting in. The lamp overhead may be causally involved. There might be lots of stuff, lots of things that are causally involved in the generation of your perception. But you wouldn't say just as you look at the table that you are seeing the sun or that that puts you in a position to refer to the sun. The lighting might be kind of hidden, so you don't even know where the lamps are. You don't know what the illuminates are. So these things are causally involved, but you're not um, seeing them or in a position to refer to them. And when uh, Evans talks about dominant source, it's not obvious that uh, that really helps sort out why that is. And why is the causal connection that, that matters, the one between you and the table, rather than the one between you and the sun? Every bit of information that you get from the table well, the sun is causally implicated in you getting that information. You see what I mean? So just saying it's the one that's involved in generating most of the information doesn't disentangle the sun and the table. Have I stated that plainly? I mean, you see there's a problem here um, that we want to um, specify more exactly which causal connections matter for reference and which don't. Solutions? It's not that hard, um, <laughs> I mean, frankly, <laughs> as you'll see in a moment, yes. Uh, dominant, source. dominant source. Yeah, dominant source, well, the, the thing about that is, the, 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 it depends exactly what you mean by dominant source, but in the face of it, it sounds like there something like quantity matters, yeah? But the sun... The table is involved in you getting lots of information, but every bit of information you're getting from the table, if, the sun, if it's only the sun that's allowing you to see the table, then the sun is causally involved in generating every bit of information that the table is involved in generating. So it's not clear why this, the table rather than the sun counts as dominant. It's not just quantity of information being generated. You, you, you see what I mean? Yes. There must be something right about that, yeah. Um, um, and that's very intuitive. You're focusing on the table in a way that you are not focusing on the sun. Yeah. But the, the trouble is to spell that out a bit. But I agree, that, 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 that's the intuitive um, uh, answer <laughs> to, to, to this puzzle. Yeah. Yep. Yep, yeah. The sun could be replaced with the lamp. That's really an interesting idea. Um, uh, it, it depends what you mean by replace, though. I mean, if the table was replaced by a duplicate, yeah, then, um, I don't know, in some sense, things would go on as before. If the sun was replaced by a duplicate, all right. But if the sun was just taken away, you wouldn't be able to see anything at all. Yeah. Right, and if you take away the sun, you won't see the table at all. Yeah, they're both involved. You, you see what I mean? Uh, yeah. The causal immediacy of the table. It's a, yeah, yeah, the sun, the sun was way downstream of the table. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, that too is an interesting idea. I mean, but what about our old friend, the mirror? The unexpected mirror that you don't realize is there. Yeah. Um, a reflection. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, but you know, if I if I've got the mirror here, right, the unexpected mirror, then it's causally in between you and me. Yes. But I don't even realize of such a thing there. Um, but I can see you in the mirror. If you wave to me, and I wave back. I, I, I'm not, that's not crazy, cause, because I know it's you, right? I mean, I still, I still might say, at least you're a reflector. 
I see the reflection. Yeah, I was trying to wave to you, if you see what I mean. I see you reflected in the mirror. Yeah. Okay, well, one last. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to make two. I, I think this is interesting, and all of these ideas are chipping away. At Figure ground. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is a bit like that focusing idea. You know, it's, it's when the thing is lifted out for you as figure from ground. And you can choose what to focus on. Yeah. Right, right. Let me try this on you. Um, um, so the, 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 this is just stating the puzzle I, 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 I just gave. That there are different causal roles for the object you're seeing, the thing illuminating it, and uh, if you see it through a telescope or through a mirror. Yeah, I, I, I see the force of saying you might just see the reflection there. But it's also equally colloquial to say I saw you through the telescope or I saw you in the mirror. Yeah, I mean, if <laughs> when you're looking at yourself in the mirror, you're looking at because you want to see how you are. You don't want to see how your reflection is, if you see what I mean. It's not just that you're interested in your, how your reflection is this morning. Do you see what I mean? You want to find out how you are. Um, okay, so what about this? I mean, I, I, I don't know that this is a comprehensive answer to the puzzle, but um, something like um, when you're making a judgment about the table and you're saying the table's are brown or the table's rectangular, then um, you're responsive to the brownness or rectangularity of the table. You see what I mean? Whereas you can't make a judgment like that about the sun just by looking at the table. You see what I mean? And actually, there's a range of characteristics the table has. Um, how big it is, just where it is. There's a stack of things you can find out. About. Is it shiny? Is it matte? Um, there's a stack of things you can find out about the table just by looking. But you can't really do that with the sun just by looking at the table. So there's some sense in which your verbal reports about the table are differentially sensitive to the characteristics of the table, but they're not differentially sensitive to the characteristics of the sun. If the sun turns up or turns down, then you can see the table better or uh, worse, but um, you're not varying your judgments about how the sun is. Yep. Flawed visual perception. Yeah. I say, well, if it hadn't been straight, then it looks straight. But when I go closer to it, it's curved. Very good. Okay. Um, so th this, this way of putting it implies that perception is always accurate, yeah, which is probably a bit too strong. Yeah. Um, right. I mean, for trained philosophers who live in a world of hallucination and illusion <laughs> and <laughs> madness and so on. Right. Um, okay. But um, I make the following claim. In ordinary perception, if you're going to be able to talk about the cup at all, it's got to be pretty much the way it looks. What I mean is, um, if, if I seem to see a badger there, yeah, then that's not, it's not that I'm looking, I, mean, I see the cup all right, but I, I, I'm just having some illusions as to what, yeah, it's not like straight or curved. Yeah. Straight or curved are pretty how should I say, they're pretty subtle uh, 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 distinctions compared to that kind of thing. Yeah? Um, if it really looks like a badger, then that's a hallucination. I'm not seeing the thing at all. I'm not able to refer to it. Um, so unless I'm getting it mostly right about the thing, yeah, the thing I'm seeing in the distance, all right, straight or curved is one thing, but roughly what size, what kind of thing, yeah? is it a fleet of aircraft or is it um, a car? Yeah, or an elephant, right? A vision can't be completely neutral about these things and still leave you in a position to refer to the thing. Yep, yep. <coughs> yes. Yeah. Um, well, 
we have some ability to keep track of objects perceptually through changes in their characteristics. Um, what I mean is, uh, just as a person waves their arms and so on, right? There's change in the position. I can demonstrate this for you now, right? There's change in the position of the arms, but you have no trouble keeping track of the object through those changes. Yeah? Whereas some changes in, the, in an object, you, can't, you have trouble keeping track of the object through those changes. Yeah? So with the case of the flowers over a period of days, yeah, uh, it seems to me a, uh, there's a spectrum of cases there. If you're just looking at a bunch of flowers, and they're, let's say, withering before your eyes, or just um, waving in the breeze, then they're, they're changing all right, but you have no trouble keeping track, on them, track of them. Um, uh, so you don't need an identity judgment. That's the same flowers again. Yeah. But sometimes um, you do. I mean, if you come back after a period of days, and they're all changed color, then you really might be a bit puzzled. Well, so have they been replaced or what? I'll, I'll say more about that, that kind of case in just a moment. Yeah. Yep. Very good. L let me uh, give you another case. Can, can, can I put that on hold just, uh, just a second? Because I, I want to give an example that I think might be an example just like that, okay, and then come back. Uh, uh, um, um, so you, you, you see how this works for proper names, that if um, you get all your information about Sally down a telephone line, I keep telling you about Sally, then um, I'm implicated, the telephone line is causally implicated, um, uh, but uh, the, the role, that's ca causal connection that Sally plays is different, because it's Sally's various characteristics that are responsible for all the judgments you make using that term. Yeah, whereas the variations in the telephone line um, don't make a difference as to whether you're going to say that Sally is tall or not. That's okay? Yeah. So there's something systematic about the, the role that Sally plays in that kind of case, the, the telephone line, um, or your informant don't play. But this is, what I, this is what I think might be an example of um, what Dylan was talking about. Suppose we go back to our old friend, um, the sinister girdle. Um, so when you're making your judgments about girdle, um, uh, you might say, well, look, my judgments about girdle are all about the, the theorems that he proved and the proofs he gave of them. So... Uh, I make judgments about how innovative um, Gödel's use of uh, uh, a recursion theory was. And um, that is actually systematically reflecting what Schmidt did. You remember the story? Yeah. <coughs> the Schmidt did the proof. And, okay. But then my judgments about Gödel, using the name Gödel, are systematically varying with what Schmidt did. You see what I mean? Is that, is that your kind of case, though? Yeah. 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 Um, so why are we going to say, I mean, isn't Gödel, isn't, isn't this guy, <laughs> right? Isn't this guy really just the conduit through which all these different characteristics of Schmidt, the mathematician, came to be uh, causally affecting our verbal judgments? And in that case, when we say Gödel, we'll be referring to Schmidt. That's the wrong answer. Because Gödel stole the credit. You see what I mean? Oh, that is Dylan's kind of case. Do, do, do you want to supplement that with a, another case? You, you're talking about reflections. Yeah, I think this is another case of the same Yeah. So th th this is a case where um, Schmidt, as it were, stands behind Gödel. So here you have um, Gödel, here you have Schmidt, and here you have the verbal reports. Yeah. And... Uh, Schmidt's causing Gödel to talk, and um, Gödel's causing our verbal reports. But who's di we're differentially sensitive to the characteristics of Schmidt when we're talking about the maths. And your kind of case was one where you've got Gödel, you've got a mirror reflection of Gödel, um, and that's causing the verbal reports. Yeah. Uh, 
And you might say, well, but we're systematically sensitive to what's going on in the mirror. Yeah. Um, yeah, these are puzzling cases. Um, and, uh, um, uh, you might say, well, this is Kripke's revenge. This is where Kripke comes back in. Because really, to look at this, it's not, you, you can't address this kind of di distinction in terms of dominant source or um, uh, differential sensitivity. Because they're equally dominant, they're equally um, uh, differentially, systematically sensitive. Um, so you've got to actually look at the details of the chain. And in this case, say, ah, but there was some funny business here, if you see what I mean. When Gödel stole the credit, that blocks the reference from going all the way back to Schmidt. Or the mirror reflection is somehow transparent in a way that means that the reference does go all the way back to Gödel here. Um, so Kripke might say, well, this, this just means you've got to look back at this historical stuff that Evans was saying, forget about that. You, you, you see what I mean? Yeah. Um, this is a homework exercise. This is <laughs> I don't have a crisp sorting out of this yet. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Suppose we take the Napoleon case where the uh, the um, the swap over happened very late. Right, is that the kind of case you're thinking of? Is that the, okay. So we've got, um, uh, I actually put this mature, uh, the, the mature imposter right, takes over very late. Um, the thing is, in the Gödel Schmidt case, Gödel is really transparently uh, transmitting, I mean, conducting all these characteristics of Schmidt. Because whatever Schmidt does, Gödel just does that, replicates that in his proof. Yeah. So when we make the verbal judgments as to what we say, that we say Gödel was doing in his proof, we are actually causally sensitive to what this guy was doing. Yeah. In the Napoleon case, um, there's the imposter and there's the, uh, the emperor, the mid-period emperor. Yeah. And the, the, there are our verbal reports, and they're being caused by the, uh, the late imposter and the mid-period emperor, but one's not acting as a conduit for the other. You see what I mean? It seems to be a different, unless I'm, mis you, uh, maybe you're reading it some different way, but my picture is that here you're getting a lot of information from this guy coming down here, and here you're just getting a, bit, a little bit of information from this guy coming down here, and that's what makes the distinction. Uh, you, you don't have that same kind of um, sneaky kind of structure as you do here. Yep. Yep. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's very good. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to say it's a way of transmitting knowledge of the thing, yeah. So let, let's take that very seriously. And now you've got Gödel, who I mean. Uh, yeah, you've got, you've got this figure who is an imposter, a fantasist, one of the flotsam and jetsam of early Vi of Vienna, early last century. Yep. Um, and what he's doing is he's hijacking this sober, serious mathematician stuff and projecting this fantasy onto it. Yep. And then you say, well, is he a reliable source? No, he is not a reliable source. He's the kind of guy who goes around pinching mathematicians' ideas. 
Yeah. Um, so, although he might actually have just written it all down, so in fact it's all just the same way as Schmidt had it, um, he's not a reliable source. So you can't get knowledge of what Schmidt was doing from this. So you could, but you could get um, a knowledge of what Gödel was doing from this chain. So although this is a causal chain, all right, back here from Schmidt to Gödel, it's not, um, how should I say, epistemic. It's not, no, it doesn't have to do, it's not a, a, a chain through which we can get knowledge, right? You, you see what I mean? So that, that's lost here. But this bit of the chain, we do get knowledge, and that's why we'd say um, uh, we're referring to Gödel rather than Schmidt. Yeah. That's really powerful, I think. That bring, there's something right about that. Um, um, I think, from an Evans point of view, there's something about this, though, that is um, it's against the, the, the thrust of Evans' account. Evans' idea, so the, 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 this is a very good way of uh, saying something peculiar about the causal chain going through, uh, back through Gödel to Schmidt, in virtue of which you're differentially sensitive to Schmidt's characteristics. Yeah, it's, it's not the right kind of causal connection to give you knowledge. Um, Evans, I think, um, when he's just talking about the dominant source of your current information, the idea was forget all that stuff about going back into history. Uh, so it's, it's alien to the spirit of Evans' account. And I think within Evans' own account, um, you'd have to be saying something like, uh, uh, look, the... What we know about Gödel is, after all, not just the mathematics. What we know about Gödel is something about um, where he was born, uh, uh, was he married, where did he live, did he have children. You, you have this picture of someone with a life, and um, the mathematics is just a little bit of the life. I mean, with all due respect. And um, what matters is that Gödel was contributing... Uh, Cover it. this person here was contributing to covering most of that biography rather than just the mathematics. Um, so I don't know, these are two different uh, lines and I think they both have something to them. Um, so the, I, I don't know, I guess that's my idea of wrapping up is to raise a lot of loose ends <laughs> and leave them as homework. Um, okay? Anyone else want to take a shot at that? Okay, I think that is actually pretty much the state of play today. I think we don't have a tight, necessary, and sufficient causal, con uh, causal account of reference. But something like that g g gives you a picture, I think, of where we are today. If you can think of something, which you might well be able to, uh, that um, the sorts out some of this, then that would be great. Yeah. Okay. Okay? Okay. So... Um, I want to just review where we are with uh, informative identities, where we began. Um, so where have we got to in informative identities? Remember Frege, this is where we began in, uh, about, I don't know, a long time ago. A equals A holds a priori and according to Kant is to be labeled analytic while statements of the form A as B often contain very valuable extensions of a knowledge and cannot be established a priori. So then, then I showed you these distressing photographs. Um, um, yeah, where you say, well, that's informative, all right. And then you think about it a bit and you think, well, those are informative too. Yes? Because it's informative. If you have a causal theory of reference, then it's informative to be told that it's the very same thing that was causally responsible for this photo as was causally responsible for that photo. And if you think that's a model of reference in general, then it's very hard to see how if you have, if signs have their references fixed by causal chains, how could you ever get an, um, an uninformative identity. It, the sameness of the sign isn't going to be enough. So how are you ever going to get an uninformative identity? But it seems like we need uninformative identities. And if you take this inference and you say, well, that needs an extra premise. Does that need an extra premise class? Yes. What is that extra premise? Uh -huh. Okay, so we've got um, the morning star is... The evening star. Okay, so now we've got an inference with three premises, right? Is that valid, or does that need another premise? Sorry? Is it good the way it is? Pick your hand up if you think it's good the way it is. 
Yeah, you really have to say that. Put up your hand if you think it needs another premise. I don't think that's a daft response if you think it needs another premise. Um, the thing is, um, if you said it needs another premise, you'd really be in trouble. If you took seriously the point that it's very hard in a causal theory to see how the identities can ever be uninformative, yeah, then um, what you'd say is, well, I don't, after all, th th this is like the case of the photographs when I have the morning star here and the morning star up there. Um, it's like the case of uh, these photographs because I don't know if what's causally behind this use of the phrase the morning star and that use of the phrase the morning star. Is that the same thing? You see what I mean? So you, you might say, so I mean, it's not a daft thing to say, well, you do need another premise because after all, the causal chain back here might be going back to something different to what the causal chain up there goes back to. So in that case, you would need another premise, namely um, something like the morning star is the morning star. And similarly for the evening star, yes? Um, but can you see the problem <laughs> at this point? Right, because are, are you done adding premises? No, you are not done adding premises. In fact, you have only just begun, right? <laughs> I mean, you're really in trouble at this point because it's just going to keep exploding and the board is not going to be big enough. Yeah? Um, so at some point, you just have got to be able to say that inference is just valid as it stands. Yeah? You, we really need these uninformative identities. You couldn't have any kind of inference involving names unless you had, um, a, you could at some point stop and say, I'm just going to use the fact of identity here in the inference. But then how do you ever get to that? I mean, how could that ever be valid? If it's not ever valid, then uh, uh, we really have lost the use of singular terms. We really can't use names for gossip and so on anymore. Um, <laughs> which would be tragic. Um, uh, but on the other hand, this thing about how is it the same causal chain, that seems very powerful. I mean, how, is the, how do you know a priori that the causal chain is going back to the same thing? Well, again, this is like another loose end. I think there isn't a canonical answer to this. It is uh, something, that, uh, uh, something that's still discussed as a kind of open problem in the literature. That's what I mean when I started, that Frege's puzzle really looks obscure and um, must be fairly straightforward when you start. It is by no means straightforward. Um, but let me just say that something about how far I think we've got. It's something like this. What certainly seems a priori and maybe analytic is if you say this general form of argument, A is F, A is G, A is F and G, arguments like that, you can say this schematically, the general form, and it can be a priori that arguments of that general form are analytic. Just the same way you can say something like um, P, if P then Q, uh, so Q, that general form of argument is valid, right? Yeah. Um, now, here I'm not talking about any particular argument. I'm just saying if you've got an argument of that form, then it's valid. Um, so here, what Frege is right about is if you've got an argument of that form, then it's a priori that it's valid. But when you're arguing this table is F, this table is G, this table is brown, this table is rectangular, so this table is brown and rectangular, yeah? Um, then uh, that is not a priori there that you really have an argument of that general form. And I'm not saying it's very unlikely, but in principle it's possible that just as I talk, some um, force from outside is zapping the table and replacing it with a qualitatively identical counterpart. Right? I don't say it's likely, but it's not a priori that it's not happening. Yeah? And of course, there are all these illusions and tricks and so on where people do substitute one thing for another and you don't realize. Yeah? So this goes back to this thing about the flowers actually changing. Um, what seems to happen is that in perception, when you're talking about the same person, it might be that you and your evil twin are both in the class. Yeah? But that you just sh <laughs> move in and out. Um, so the, the two of you are never in the class at the same time, right? That's a possible scenario. Yes? Um, and then um, 
if people talk about you and say, um, that person's F, that person's G, that person's both F and G, then that's not actually a valid argument. Yep. So when somebody does put information together from different sources, uh, sorry, does put information together um, from different premises about you as true of the same thing, then you're assuming that that's not happening. There aren't being substitutions you don't notice. So you could say, well, what's happening is um, the general form of argument, um, what does this general form of argument require? A is F, A is G, A is F and G. Um, well, what that requires is that you have the same sense for A every time. Right, it's not just the same sign, it's the same sense. But what does same sense require? Same sense requires that you've got the sign A and you've got a causal chain back to a particular object. So think of sameness of sense not as a matter of um, sameness of description or something like that. Think of same sense as a matter of your way of causally locking on to the object and keeping that the same. So that if I say to you, watch this piece of chalk, watch this very carefully, right? You can do that. You can lock on to the piece of chalk and keep tabs on it over a period of time. That's what sense is. It's a way of causally locking on to an object and keeping tabs on it over a period of time. So that if you've causally locked on to the same object in the same way all the way through here, and you're just expressing that, then you've got a valid inference. It's not a priori that you're right, because you might have made a mistake. You might think you'd causally locked on to the same thing, but not have causally locked on to it. But if you have, then when you say, he's thrown that piece of chalk once, he's thrown that piece of chalk twice, he's thrown that piece of chalk three times, right? <laughs> you're putting together information over time. Um, and you're using this perceptual ability to keep tabs on the sameness of the object over time. And something like that seems to go on in speech too. If you're talking about um, your friend Sally, um, you might say Sally the singer, Sally the singer, and just use a tag like that to, so I can, keep sh I can be sure it's the same Sally you're talking about over the period of time. It's not a priori that you're... Um, uh, that, you're really manage that I'm really managing to keep tabs on one and the same object. But uh, uh, if I am doing it, then I have the right, if I am managing to keep tabs on the same object, then I have the right to make this kind of inference without any further premises. Okay, so I think, that, I think something like that is where we are with informative identities. If you say that does not sound like a neat and tidy theory to me, I think you're right. It does not sound like a neat and tidy theory to me either. Um, but something like that is a state of play. I don't know, maybe the GSI know some cutting edge stuff that I don't, but <laughs> I think that is where we have got to. Yeah. yeah. Right. Does that make sense anyhow? Yeah. You, see, you see what I'm suggesting? Okay, <laughs> that was the right answer. <laughs> right. Okay, okay, um, okay. Let me um, talk a little bit more broadly uh, now about um, uh, how this way of uh, these ways of thinking about reference affect your knowledge of your own mind. We talked about this earlier that you can have. It's very tempting to think if you just shut your eyes, close out the world, you can have authoritative knowledge of your own thoughts. You know whether you're thinking, and you know what you're thinking, just by inner reflection. It doesn't matter what's going on around you. But if you buy um, a causal theory, then that kind of uh, uh, claim really doesn't seem so good anymore. You know what you're thinking. You know when you're thinking the same thought, when you're thinking a different thought. Right? So it's not just that I know that I'm thinking, I know which things I'm thinking. But if I know which things I'm thinking, then I must be able to tell when I'm thinking the same thought or a different thought. 
And the trouble is that a causal theory seems to threaten this kind of idea. We came upon that earlier. But I want to just put this round another way. Suppose you say, look, um, uh, let's suppose the causal theory is correct. I don't see why we can't hang on to the idea that even in splendid isolation, I can know whether I'm thinking and know what I'm thinking. Yeah, let's try and do that. So in that case, suppose you shut out the world. Um, you sit in your study and you think, um, well, what's going on? And you have a thought, as one does, about Gödel. You think, is that really right, that Schmidt stuff? Gödel is innocent, you think. Um, Gödel was framed. Um, so what happens is you're struck by a particular thought about Gödel. And then you say to yourself, I'm thinking about Gödel. Okay? You can do that. Right, there you are. That's you. I'm thinking about Gödel. And then you think, well, if I'm thinking about Gödel, then by the causal theory of reference, there must be such a person as Gödel. And Gödel must be causing me to think this very thought. So since I'm thinking about Gödel, Gödel exists. Right? And if you've read Kripke, then you know that. Okay? So there you are, locked away, thinking you're, uh, and suddenly you've established the existence of Gödel. How do you do that? Right? I mean, and of course, one, if it doesn't just work for Gödel, I mean, it will work for water too. You are locked away with your own thoughts. You have a thought about water. You think, I'm thinking about water. Therefore, there is such a stuff as water. And you know that just by reflecting in the contents of your own mind. How did that happen? You realize now the benefits of knowing about the causal theory of reference? Because it's knowing about the causal theory of reference that lets you do this, right? Well, again, this is, it's not that I'm suggesting a tidy resolution here, but let me suggest um, a way of thinking about this. Suppose you've got it that um, you're thinking about Gödel uh, and you get from that to Gödel exists. Well, maybe that transition is all right. I mean, if the causal theory of reference is right, then that is a kind of a priori transition, right? You couldn't be thinking about Gödel unless Gödel existed. You couldn't be thinking about water unless water existed. I mean, that's, it's quite intuitive anyhow. But how do you know that you're thinking about Gödel? Well, maybe you could only conclude that you're thinking about Gödel if you already know about Gödel's existence. So maybe that thought justifies you in saying you're thinking about Gödel, but does it only if you already know about Gödel's existence? I suppose you didn't know whether Gödel existed. Suppose you thought that Gödel was just someone who figured in a thought experiment of Kripke's. Right? Then it could happen that you were actually having a thought about Gödel, but didn't realize that this was a thought about Gödel because you thought it was a thought about um, an imaginary person in a thought experiment of Kripke's. Yeah? So it's only if you have knowledge of Gödel's existence that the, fo the first thing there justifies you in thinking the second thing. So you've got here an argument, a, a trans set of transitions that are correct, but they don't actually generate knowledge of the conclusion. Because you had to know the conclusion to make the transitions. Yeah? So that might be one thing that would block that kind of inference. And if it is, it's an example of a much more general phenomenon. This is, um, in the trade, this is called transmission failure, where um, you start out with something you know, and you make valid, uh, correct transitions from that, and you get to a conclusion, but you don't know the conclusion um, uh, on the basis of these, these transitions, because you had to know the conclusion already, in order for these transitions to be correct. 
So the reason I say it's quite general is you might think that something like that goes on with Descartes' cogito. How about Descartes' cogito? You guys all seem pretty clued up about Descartes. Descartes? Doodle Descartes. Okay, so Descartes' cogito is kind of like that, if you think about it. It's it, only these inferences point you from the thought out to the world, right? And that's what's weird about them. Descartes' inferences point him from the thought back to his own existence, right? That's what he was doing, I think, therefore I exist. Yeah. Um, but you th they seem vulnerable to the same kind of complaint because what's going on here is Descartes has a thought. He thinks, that's me, I'm doing that. Look at that, that was me, I'm thinking. And then he says, so I exist. And then people said, but how do, can you just do that again? Um, <laughs> how did that prove your own existence? Didn't that in some way presuppose your own existence? And you could think that's got the same kind of structure, actually. If you think how you get from just having a conscious thought to the judgment, I'm thinking, well, if you already knew you existed, if you already knew about yourself, and then you have the thought, um, and then you can say, that's me, I'm doing that, I'm having that thought, therefore I exist. But you had to know of your own existence to get the cl conclusion out. Do you, do you see what I mean? Yep. Um, if you didn't know of your own existence, and you're just struck by a thought, you wouldn't be able to tell it was you that was doing it, because you wouldn't know there was any such thing. Just as here, if you didn't know um, of Gödel's existence, then when you had a thought, you wouldn't be able to say to, you, to, to yourself, well, I'm thinking about Gödel. One other, I mean, I think this is a, I, I guess what I really want to get at is, these inferences might strike you as pretty weird, and in a way they are pretty weird, right, from you, your, your own thoughts to the way the external world is, but um, they, are a fa they are part of a family of really interesting and um, uh, uh, that have the same structure, and they are really interesting, and it's hard to diagnose exactly what's going wrong with them. Here's one other last case. I don't know if you, I, I, you all know about Descartes, I guess. What about G.E. Moore? This is one hand, and this is another. Yeah, okay. G.E. Moore gave the following proof of the existence of the external world. The skeptic questions the existence of the external world, says there are no material objects. G.E. Moore gave um, a very long talk in which he discussed the nature of material objects and so on, and then said, look, here, here I can prove the existence of a material world. This is one hand, this is another. Hands are material objects. Therefore, there are material objects. Therefore, there is an external world. <laughs> That's a common reaction to all of these arguments. <laughs> Hands are material objects, therefore there are material objects, therefore there's an external world. Now, and his point was, you can be as certain of the existence of a hand as you can of the premise of any sceptical argument. That's just where we come in. But you might think this argument too has that same structure. You get a perceptual experience, you make the judgment, this is one hand, and you say external objects exist. But your perceptual experience only lets you draw the conclusion this is one hand, if you already know that external objects exist. Yeah? So Moore is trying to get from the experience to the external world, and he faces that same structure of problems. So whatever you think of the particular diagnosis I'm giving in terms of transmission failure, um, I really want to just end by highlighting these kinds of inferences. These are really interesting inferences. Yeah? Okay, so Putnam on Friday. Okay, thanks.